to imagine my own mind one day when you're like, uh, mom wants a own, <laughs> mom wants a family band, so let's do this. <laughs> and they're like, oh, mom, come on, get another hobby. You fiddle, you fiddle, you, you fiddle. And then it's like, well, what are we going to call ourselves? I already got the name. We're just going to be the McMaster family. It's like, what about one of us play the spoons? Fiddler and the spoons. <laughs> how, how about bare naked babies? <laughs> I came somewhat prepared. If you ever see the uh, email that we send out, we call it a Tinder date, but the person actually shows up. That's kind of my joke of, hey, I'll do a little bit of research on you, but I want to also you to kind of enlighten me about your career. So I have some jot notes. And okay. if I was looking at your resume, like yeah. if I was pretending it was a resume, I'll put on my thick glasses here. Yeah. Uh, you know, seven kids started fiddling at nine. Uh, Artist of the Year Award from ECMAs, two Junos, Fill of the Year from CCMAs, Honorary Doctorate from, people would think it would be McMaster. It's not. It's, okay. Ni <laughs> it's Niagara, uh, Order of Canada, Order of Nova Scotia. And now Sketches was uh, nominated for a traditional album of the year. And, you know, with all that being said, throw away me stats here. I don't know where that went. Uh, but, but like, that's a lot on a resume. And I did it in order. Of course, the seven kids is top priority. Uh, but, but when you look at all that and you look at like, you know, yeah. coming from, uh, I think it's Troy, Nova Scotia. Yeah, that's right. Like, what do you think looking back? What do I think looking back? My goodness. I, it's so interesting. I, I don't know. There's, there's a number of different ways my thoughts take me. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you the really cool thing that's similar to what you're talking about. <clears throat> One day, I suppose it was maybe like, not this summer, but last summer, I remember sitting out on our porch. We have a porch swing and we live, yeah, I won't tell you, but that's part of the thing. So I, I just went like this. I was sitting on the porch swing. It was a beautiful sunny day and I, I just went like this. And I really and truly pretended that someone put their hands on my eyes in 1991 it's 1991 i was thinking it's 1991 it's like my first year of college or second year of college whatever it was and someone put their hands over my eyes and they say natalie i'm gonna show you a glimpse in your life like 28 years from now or whatever it is uh, something like that and uh, i'm like okay i'm ready for it and then i took my hand away and I tried to see it as if I was a 20 year old girl from that perspective. And I was thrilled. I was like, oh my gosh, I have seven kids. Oh my gosh, I did marry that guy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I live on a farm. I have horses, <laughs> I have cows. Oh my gosh, I'm still playing the fiddle. I did all these things with my fiddle. Oh my gosh, my kids are playing fiddle. My husband plays fiddle. Look at all the music around us. Oh my gosh, I have chickens. I have a dog. I'm like, look at my house. Oh my gosh, look at my beautiful house. And so it's a similar thing as when you just rhymed off all those things. If you let yourself fall into that, yeah, you 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 need to do that every once in a while with with a fresh a fresh mind and and just say, look where life has taken me. I, I like how you brought up the chicken aspect because, you know, it's a little bit of a, a dialogue here that I thought like, so I grew up watching like Sharon Lois and Bram. My two brothers annoy me, annoy me to this day of saying like, we couldn't watch our TV shows because little Brian wanted to watch Sharon Lois and Bram. But I just thought it was a, kind of like a, I guess the kids today call it almost like a, an Easter egg. Uh, but it's like, you actually got to perform with Sharon Lois and Bram. And one of the songs that you did sing about was the C-H-I-C-K-E-N song. C-H-I-C-K, okay. Do yeah, you remember yeah. the actual yeah. thing I did with them? Like, I don't even remember what I did with them. No, no, but like, uh, yeah, like doing a little bit of research. Like, I remember seeing it as a, as a child, but like when yeah. I did a little bit of research, I was like, oh yeah, like I remember that. But when you bring it up of like, it seems like the very passion of the farm, the animals and the, the chicken, I was just like, yeah, it's almost like it was made to be there. Like they, it's almost like at that time they're like, hey, you know she likes chickens, so let's get her to do this. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so cool. Like, 
Yeah, isn't that amazing? Oh, like I did the Fred Penner show too. Do you remember Fred Penner? Yeah, like, okay, so it's a little bit, be like, I know seeing clips of it, but, like, again, you know how every kid has their own kind of favorite TV show? Yeah. It's not a, a disc or anything at him. It's just that when it comes to Mr. Dress Up, Sharon Lewis and Bram, that was it. But, yeah, oh, my yeah. my brothers probably know a little bit more about, you know, that area, per se. But I, I got you. Yeah, I got yeah. you. But I'm just saying that I yeah. did some kids things. I did Sesame Street, too, and I, I don't exactly remember what I did, but... When you mentioned that the C H I C K song, like yeah, if I, I'd, wouldn't I love to see that now? Yeah, well, see, that's the thing. Like, some sometimes you want to see it, and then other times you look back and you don't want to see it. Like, I, I oh no, I always want to see it. Anything from twenty years ago when I was looking hot, I was like, oh yeah, I want to remember that version. Yeah, yeah, that's when you want to call in the husband, like, hey, this is what you yes. married. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I kind of like, of course, I do want to get into the music side of things, but now as a person with a disability, I, I'm kind of fascinated because again, you have seven children, you mentioned that they all play fiddle, and I hope it's not stepping out of bounds here when I say this, but you do have a little one that I, I believe it's, does she have, is it Down syndrome? Down syndrome, yes. And like, yes. I, I, I watched the Christmas concert this year uh, with my parents, and I like how you included her because I know it sounds like when you say it, like, yeah, you know, why wouldn't she include your child? Like, why wouldn't she? But there are times that people will be like, uh, no, like, let's let's just, it's not for you. We don't want you out on display. And I'm kind of like, mm. you don't see it. You don't hear about it because it's covered up. But I like how even, even if it's limited, you included her in that. And I like how she was grinning from ear to ear. So as a person with a disability, I was like, wow, they're, they're making her feel included. She's going to look back at this when she's older and be like, all right, maybe I'm not the best fiddle player. I'm not the greatest at this, but at least they made me feel welcome. Yeah. 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 See, see, it's interesting. You know, we, we do have a daughter with Down syndrome. And at the time when it was unexpected, you know, like, you know, I, I gave birth to her. And a few minutes later, the doctor said, I think we, your daughter has Down syndrome. And I was just a shock of shocks of shocks of shocks. Mind yeah. you, any woman who's expecting a baby always wonders, oh, I hope my baby's healthy and safe and, you know, has... You know all their fingers and toes and all that so that was a lot to deal with but oh my gosh so quickly Danelle and I figured out oh my gosh there's no difference between her and the rest of them they all have their own personalities they all have their like she's exactly the same it's just yeah. that she's got Down syndrome so we don't see her as different you know like so yeah it's not even a thought she just gets included because <laughs> she's, she's just one of the team so yeah. When she, when she goes and does her thing and that little cookie she is going to be able to play the fiddle she did of course on the show that you saw but she's just starting learning she's yeah. gonna be i know she's got it in her she's got yeah. a ton of music it, it, it's just it's just like so i guess kind of encouraging and enlightening to see because i mean there's other there, there could be other adults out there that's looking at that like of course they're looking at it from oh yeah it's like natalie mcmaster like i i grew up watching her and then when they see when, like you know she comes out and tries her best playing it or just including her they're like yeah. even if it's a parent who don't know who doesn't know your music or your career but turned it on and then they're like oh look look she is a little fiddle player there herself and then they might say oh well if they have a child with down syndrome or disability they're like wait a minute if she's gonna at least try it and she's gonna be successful at it yeah. why can't you know, and it gets, I guess, a conversation going as well. That's right. That's right. No, it's good. It's good. It's a sharing for sure. I love it. I think it's easier for us too, just because we have so many kids, it's easier for her to be not seen as different or, or to be to be included because she's not even the youngest. We have a two-year-old yeah. as well. So she's just in there. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> if, if it was our only child, we might look at it differently or something, but it's, boy, when you, when you, go through it and all that you realize there's nothing to fear you just you just love them up oh what a what a darling yeah i could actually talk about her all day and no one ever asks me about her in an interview ever so oh, really thank you. yes and i just oh i like i said i i'll stop talking about her but she is one gem no no i i, I like it just because i feel like you know on my own front as a person with disability like you know it sometimes gets overshadowed or it's not something you like, I don't know, like kind of, I'm not going to say like in a mean way, like promote it or like, Hey, I'm a person with disability, blah, blah, blah. But it is nice if someone ever comes stumbles across an interview and it could be like your favorite act, athlete, musician. And they just, they just mentioned in passing like, Hey, when I was five, 
uh, this happened and I was born with this. You're like, didn't know, good to know. Like I stumbled across, I think it was like Ed Sheeran had a stutter when he was smaller and he listened to Eminem to kind of, which is the, like almost a weird way to get rid of your stutter, listen to a rapper that's gonna rap super fast. But I was like, all right, there's probably kids out there with a stutter that look at Ed Sheeran and go, totally. okay, I wow. So, yeah. you know, that's that's my kind of side of bringing it up. Cause I was like, you know, yeah. years later from now, if she turns into be a great fiddle player, you can come back and be like, actually, no one ever asked about you except for this interview. And now <laughs> right. we'll, have like, we'll have the That's exclusive. Right. Um, no, it is great. Isn't it so, it's so great. Thank you. That's wonderful that, that you just bring her little sweet name up. No, it's not at all. And now I, I, we will get back into, because I, I want to get into, of course, the, the other children as well. Um, the kind of joke that I was going to start off with here. And then I was like, yeah, let's, let's not start off with a joke just to feel it out here. But I was just ever going to wonder, like, with all the stuff that comes on TV now, like CMT when I grew up used to be just country music. Um, yeah. I'm not against having Reba on CMT. That kind of coincides. But when I do see, like, home improvement or, like, reality shows, I'm like, oh, okay, you're coming out of your comfort zone. But yeah. have you ever imagined CMT coming up to you and be like, we got a great idea, Natalie. We got you, seven kids, reality TV show. We're going <laughs> to, let's do this. <laughs> You mean can I see them doing that? Yeah, like w like if they if they did, would you be would you be on board or would you be like, hey, hey, I see how you do reality TV shows. I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> well, it, it's a great question. People do often say, oh, you guys would be great for a reality TV show, and I'm often going through the house here thinking to myself, oh, we'd be perfect for one of those things. <laughs> Things. like if people could see me what I'm doing right now yeah. like you know with the kids or whatever messes or just you know and then on stage with all the glitz and glamour and all that it's just it's a real you know two two opposites and it's great it's so healthy so to answer your question yeah if, if we've actually been officially asked twice to do a, tel a rally show and for a couple of different reasons at the time it didn't work out and Danelle and I keep saying well you know what there there may come a time who knows but I will tell you this we've decided to and no one knows this yet no one but we've decided to do some of that ourselves starting in March mid-March and I'll make nice. an official announcement and describe more about what it's about um when March comes along on our social media stuff but we're going to be doing that we're going to be yeah, doing like, that like I think stuff. I think it'd be interesting to see because I know in the world of say um, TikTok, Instagram, like Twitter, not maybe not so much Twitter, but with Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, like you get to see more behind the scenes stuff. Like I know growing up watching say a much music or CMT, you'd see the music video. You might get lucky afterwards where they did a, a concert and then you'd see them on stage getting interviewed. But now it's almost like, I feel it's it's kind of I don't want to say privilege, but for kids when you go back and be like, I I was watching like the Rankin family and then they came off stage and then like it was just mind blowing to actually see them do an interview off stage and then some of them are like yeah well I just seen them like all the time on their Facebook and their Twitter and they're always and I'm like yeah but you don't realize how how in depth that was you actually felt like oh my God am I supposed yeah. to be a part of this interview where now it's like Heather Rankin can post I'm in my kitchen making cookies and your list are like. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh yeah, she she posted that like twenty times. I'm like, yeah, but that's cool. You didn't get that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That is so <laughs> cool. Yeah, I know it's really different. Yeah, like so becoming so common to get into people's personal space, and especially with COVID now, it's even more so. Yeah, I mean, people like reality, I guess, and reality is becoming less of a novelty and more of the common. When I put out this earlier on Twitter and uh, actually Heather Rankin was one of the first ones to like it. So I was like, oh, it's like, but I, I realized there's a little bit of a tie there too, is when your second album, I know at 16, I think you released your first one, but I, I believe it was your second album. Um, it was John Morris helped you with that one, correct? He was on the first one and the second. Yeah. Oh, on the second one as well. Yeah. 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 Can you kind of tell me, I guess, your relationship with him at the time and just your relationship with the Rankins, because when you think Nova Scotia, there's a few acts that come to mind. And like, to me, that's one of the big ones is the Rankin family. Absolutely. Well, there would be no bigger fan of yeah. the Rankins than this puppy right here. <laughs> oh, and, and they, 
they had asked me, I'll tell you about Jim Morris in a minute, but they had asked me to do some shows with them. And I was like, because Howie couldn't do it or something. And I was freaking out. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I had to learn the stuff and I'm learning by ear. And I'm, oh my gosh, I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. And I was so awkward and I still had, didn't have my confident stage legs underneath me yet. I think I was probably just like 16 or, I don't know, maybe I was 18 or 19, but I wasn't very old. And, uh, and I was, it was absolutely thrilling and I dare say with all the other accolades or adventures or everything that I've done since then there might not be one so exciting as the day I got to play with them for the first time and the second time and the third time and the fourth time like it was just being at that age and revering them so much they have no idea but I will tell you about Jim Morris. Jim Morris helped me with uh my uh, second CD, but he played on my first CD. So he kind of helped guide the ship a little better on the second CD, or it wasn't a CD at all, it was a cassette. And on the first one, but Jim Morris, Jim Morris's name in Cape Breton is Golden. And he was a very humble, uh, unassuming master, mastermind, brilliant. Um, and he didn't even know his brilliance, I'm sure. He was just so natural. And we all loved him. And I still think of him. And I, yeah, I oftentimes will fondly remember John Morris and offer up a prayer or something because he meant a lot to many of us, especially me. Yeah, like, so, like, because I know when, when I was growing up, when you think of, like, say, East Coast music, like, I know for here in Newfoundland, we have, say, Great Big C, Alan Doyle, the Anna Sisters come to mind. Uh, I think, like, the Fables, Shani Canuck. Um, but like, I always saw fascinating just being from the East coast of like, we had our kind of own, like you have your East coast, your East coast music awards to appreciate mm -hmm. everything that comes from the East coast, mm -hmm. but there was always like a distinct sound. So when I think of Nova or Newfoundland music, it kind of ties in with Nova Scotia. But when I think like fiddle, uh, yes, there's a bit of Irish and Scottish to it, but I always saw it going to Nova Scotia. It's like, if it's like a stereotype, when you think of Newfoundland, it's like, boats, fishery. And I thought when it came to music with Nova Scotia, it's like if I go to school here or if I meet someone there and they don't take out a fiddle, I'm going to be like, are you even from Nova Scotia? <laughs> it's very, very popular. Yeah. I, I really noticed that too up here living in Ontario. Like there's a fiddle culture here, but it's you have to really look hard to find it. I know where to find it. You have yeah. to dig. And even at that too, there's it has to be certain times a year and all of that. So at home, well, especially in Cape Breton, of course, there's, that's a way of life. It really is. Like it certainly was for me. It certainly was in our home, in our community and, and how I grew up. And you don't realize how special that is until you're away from it. And yeah. you're like, wow, that's not normal. I remember when Danelle and I, first got married and we moved to on i moved to ontario i went up Danielle's from ontario and at the time he, we got married i was renting an apartment in halifax and he owned hundreds of acres of land hundreds of cows and a house so i just it was kind of made clear to yeah. us and I, i'm not one to uh to you know to to barter or try yeah. and argue about things or whatever. I was like, no, this seems like God is pointing me in this direction. So I came to Ontario and I remember we were asked to go to a friend's house one night. And so we went and on the way home from their house, I said to Danelle, that was weird. He's like, what? I'm like, why did they get us over? Like, there was no music. It was just ch chatting. I'm like, what's the point? He laughed. He said, I said, and, I, and it was that point I realized I've never been to a house party or someone's house without an event, like a, a live music, live music. There was always live music. You, it was just, we never went to someone's house unless there was a party, a house, music party. So I was 30 years old when I got married. So imagine discovering that. I'm like, wow, yeah. I really grew up in a, a cool place with cool traditions and, and, and yeah, so it's very endearing to me now. Like, I, I like that story because so my aspect of it from going from Newfoundland to Ottawa for school was almost like the parties that I would go to would, would you wouldn't have people 
singing or dancing, you might have the one guy that people are like, oh, it's the guitar guy that just wants to sing a song. And I'm like, all right. Like, I don't know if it's just being like an East Coast. I'm like, let him play. Like, okay. Like if you guys think he's a douche because he's playing a guitar or he's trying to like impress someone, whatever. Like it's, it's at least background music, if nothing else. But I would go to some parties and yeah, like I, I got used to it where you just engage with people. They just interact. I'm like, that's fine with me. You go to other parties and they, they do come out and have people sing or dance. I'm like, all right. Like I like a mixture of both, but I, I do find when you take someone from just say the Ontario side, bring them to the East coast side of stuff. And they are like going on their wits about, well, we have like the best parties in Ontario, blah, blah, blah. you bring them just one night down to like, you know, and a Newfoundland pub or in one of your friend's house and the next mentor like, oh my God, I'm so drained. I can't go, I can't do this every night. I'm like, you can't do this every night. So what kind of parties were you going to before you came here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I do find though that they appreciate it. My, my experience too is that when people from away come home and engage in some of the culture like that, they're always like, wow, it's so amazing. Yeah. Like they see it with a fresh eye too. And they, any experience I've had anyway, they're like, that's really amazing. It's beautiful. Like how cool, like you guys have such a great thing. I feel, I feel so. like every, every like team, every organization, every workplace, you need at least maybe one East Coaster on that somewhere because it's like, okay. I, I know my first year at, in Ottawa, when you're going to parliament, I, I'm, I think I was 22. So I should kind of know better. I'm not like a 16 year old kid walking around, like, like the world is my oyster, but it was on parliament Hill. Uh, people were just going around tourism in summer. And I think I put on like great big C and I had it on my both speakers in my backpack. So like, no one really knows where it's coming from. They get an yeah. idea when they're closer, but people yeah. were looking around and going like, what's that? What kind of music is that? And I was just still like, I was like, I, I don't know where it's coming from, but I'm going to sing along to it. Like, yeah, of course I know where it's coming from. It's my backpack. But I do it at soccer. And then you'll get some parents or some players that are kind of like, okay, this, this isn't really for me. But I'm like, geez, this is the equivalent to my amped up music or to get me excited to play a sport. So I feel like it's, it's funny to me because I imagine in a locker room when you go to a hockey locker room and they're playing rap or hip hop, I, I just... I like to believe like Nathan McKinnon or Sidney Crosby is putting on like, you know, fiddle music. And then they're just all like, what? And they're like, I'm ready. Let's do this. Let's play this game. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be great to hear, to know that they were listening to that, but who knows? But I mean, if you're growing up there, you, yeah, you gotta get a little bit of, of it in you. And I like, again, once again, I do think it's when you step away from it, that it becomes so endearing. I think it's when you get away from it, like I know lots of people that don't like it, right? Yeah. From home. I know lots of people that just, they're not into their own tradition, culture, whatever, or they're just, it's, it's kind of stupid or whatever. So that's okay too. Um, but when they go away and they're living away from home and they're gone 10 years and then we come on tour and they come out and they come up to me and they say, yeah. Natalie, oh my gosh, I was crying. They're making me feel home. I never used to bother with this stuff when I was home, but now that I'm away, it's it's so special. And thanks for thanks for touching my heart, you know. So I, I want to get into because you mentioned, of course, like it's a way of life, kind of, in, in, and I and I see that with like Kate Breton, per, exactly for sure. But it's at nine, I believe you said you kind of grabbed the fiddle. But like I guess it's different because when you see someone just say my age or sixteen or whatever, like grab a guitar. It's kind of like the popular instrument at that time. It's something that people are like grabbed to like, oh yeah, I'll play a guitar or I'll play the piano. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and I could be wrong here, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you know, with the background of the fiddle, was that kind of like, ah, I'll play the fiddle because like, you know, I got family members that played the fiddle uh, or were you just gravitated towards the way it sounded? Like, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at here is people who usually go towards a guitar or piano, what drove you more or less towards the fiddle? I got a, a three-quarter size fiddle from a relative, my grand uncle Charlie McMaster. So I was nine. So people often say, oh, you're nine. I would have thought you'd start. It seems like you get a fiddle in your hand. I'm like, well, no kids played those ages, like not when I was that age. So 
I asked my mom and dad about it now, and she said, well, we, we never thought about putting a fiddle in your hands because we didn't know they made them that small. <laughs> so dad had a fiddle in the house. Like, dad played a little bit. It was a full-size fiddle. So at the age four and five and six, I can't even, like, it's like yeah. here. And so by the time this this relative sent a fiddle to to not not just to me it was it was it was sent for any one of the McMaster children the big overall yeah. clan of McMasters anyone who wanted it could have it and so I was the one that heard about it and show said I'd like to try it and I started it that night and I have not put it down since so like and of course when you started learning and it, we kind of went into when you were around 16 with the whole first album and second album but like mm -hmm. I guess at what stage because again like you you think of say when it comes to pop music or country music like it has its genre it has its place like I can list off like say 20 pop stars 20 country stars that would be world known uh I believe, I believe that's the word I could have whatever messed that one up but um like what kind of drove you like when you started getting recognized I guess not just in your own at province but across Canada did you think like oh this is this is amazing or it was almost like if it comes it comes if it don't I'm just gonna I have a passion for this regardless I have a passion for it regardless when I was um, nine and playing age 10 11 12 13 into my teens I never thought that a person could could be a fiddler yeah that's I alone mean. like fiddler of the year <laughs> <laughs> like I just didn't think you do that because everybody that I looked to and, and looked up to were all, they were all older and they all had jobs. So they yeah. played the fiddle on the side. I didn't know anybody who just did that. So I didn't think you do that. I didn't think that was an option, but I knew I'd always, I practiced every day. I practiced hard every day. I, I knew there was just something about the challenge of knowing deep down that you can do something or pretty sure I can do that. I just have to spend a lot of time at it to do it. Yeah. It kind of makes you, there's something about that challenge. That's what was a lot of the growth for me was knowing I could do it, but just having to put the time into it. It was the challenge of that. So through the years, I, I kept it up and, um, and I, I have to say, I'm having a bit of a mother moment. I've lost what the question was. What the Dickens was I talking about, Brian? Oh my God. No, no, like, I, I love I, everybody. I, like, <laughs> no, I was saying like, Cause when I mentioned if you were doing it for like, cause some people oh, play, yes. yeah, like play the instrument and then hope someday it leads somewhere and right. then others play for passion. Like it's, it's kind of an unfair, I guess, question in a way because you're going to play, it's not like you're going to just pick up an instrument and be like, oh, I hate doing this, but I hope someday that people recognize me for it. It's, totally. right? <laughs> but it's a great question. It's a great question. And certainly all through the years I was motivated by, by the challenge of it, but as I got into, and, and I, for some reason, I, I said to my mom, she always reminds me, she said, you always said you'd do this for till the day you die. And I always just felt like that. I thought, well, I'll always play fiddle. And in the meantime, I went to teacher's college and okay. I thought, hey, I'll be a teacher. And I picked teaching because I love kids. And I thought it gives me summers, weekends, holidays free to go play fiddle. Yeah. And so I do have my teaching degree, but through my going to college, the music requests and everything, I was just traveling so much with music that I ended up having to finish my degree, you know, through correspondence. And I decided maybe in year three, I thought, I don't think I'm going to be a teacher. Like this is taking over. I was probably 20, 21. And so... And, that the, and then you heard more of people like the Rankin family who were becoming so big and yeah. people were doing this, East Coasters were doing this and even fiddlers were doing this. And it just, it was that great magical time. And I was lucky to be in on that time and it worked so well for me. And, and I, I, and here it is, I'm 48. I started playing when I was nine. So that's a long time. That's a lot of decades to be fiddling, and that's all I've ever done. Now, like, never, it, it, never did, never did get my foot in a schoolroom. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you you taught your own kids how to play fiddle. I mean, that that in itself, you can say that's their teaching moment. Yeah, well, actually, we homeschool. That's kind of ironic. <laughs> um, yeah, it all comes full circle either way. Now, now you get to see what kind of teacher you would have been, and then you realize 
Okay, maybe not, maybe not for me. <laughs> That's so true. Um, yeah. But I, I kind of want to mention a little bit coinciding with with what you mentioned there was, you know, when you said like you started seeing fiddlers or fiddlers kind of um, continue on with it. And then the Rankin family did become kind of successful as well. Like did Nash, it, I, I won't call it an unfair question, but kind of similar to what I just asked was like when you start seeing them become successful doing, you know, you've seen a fiddler in their band as well. Did you think like, I'm, I'm a part of this wave because sometimes you hear like, oh, that person was just not born in the right time or, you know, they just missed, they just missed it and yeah. they go underappreciated. But I feel like you came along at the right time, right place because, you know, the Rankins are coming up. You're starting to get yeah. like, uh, I'll, I'll even put in like the Ennis sisters, Great Big C starting to get recognized as well yeah. for, and then it's just like, it's almost like, oh my God, we have to travel to Nova Scotia. We have to find the next big thing we get like even if they're on the rise we have to put them out there yeah i think that i probably wasn't aware of it as much as i was after after yeah. like after years had passed you look back and you say like even my husband danelle talks to our oldest daughter mary Frances, who's 15 who wants to play fiddle she she hasn't said that's what she wants to do for a career or anything but she yeah. knows She's always, she's like me. She plays it all the time and she knows she's always, she'll always play. Danelle says things to her like, you know, when your mother was your age, this worldly attraction to this type of music was just starting. And yeah. she was just born at the right time and she was a girl and there weren't a lot of girls and, and girl fiddlers and finesse and, 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 just the way the industry was back then. So all these things Mary Frances doesn't have. Like now a girl fiddler is no big deal. Like there's more girls. The boys probably playing the fiddle. And generally across the board, girls are doing more than boys. Girls are doing more than girls were, yeah. you know, decades ago. It's just kind of, that's the, that's, you know, that's what's been happening. And we work outside the home now and all those sorts of things. So she doesn't have that freshness and she doesn't have the music industry the way it was when we were that age and Celtic music, you know, dancing and fiddling at the same time, all those things, they've been, it's been there, done that type thing. So, yeah. you know, so she'll have to make her own ground some other way. But to answer your question, I didn't realize when I was in that moment, how special that moment was until I was kind of, you know, on the other side of it. Yeah. I, I kind of want to tease it in the sense of like, you know, where you said she's 15 and you, you said she'll always kind of play the fiddle or know that she has it. But I almost feel like as if it was like a reality TV show and they're like, okay, that's great. You're very encouraging. But the crowd, the fans want to see some like um, drama here. So it's almost like getting Darnell to be like, yeah, well, guess what? When your mom was nine, she was playing it. And when she was 16, she already had an album. So what are you doing? And then you get her walking away into her room being like, I hate how every time I try my best, they're just in my face. <laughs> it's like, it's like, okay, cut. Awesome. Good scene. It's like, yeah, but you just kind of tore her apart. <laughs> Um, so I, I like how you just basically said, like, in the in the nicer way, it's like, hey, you know, if you play it, great. If you got other aspirations, but I, I do like when you mentioned about the music industry and how it changed. Some people will argue for the better, some will argue for the worse. I think someone like herself or any one of your family members, per se, uh, you know, if they're on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, and they just start uploading clips of themselves doing something, it's almost like instantly that starts getting attraction where back in the day it was like you had to basically crawl up to say universal music or warner music and be like let me play for you so you can see my talent and they're like no go away and then eventually they're like hey did you hear that person on the radio it's like yeah they came to your window or their door like three years ago oh crap we missed it but now it's like instantly you put up something online and then if it goes trending it's like someone phones you the next day and be like hey were you the girl that turned off that told off lebron james at a game let's get you on a, a radio show it's like oh man so <laughs> do you, yeah. yeah so i feel like it, it has its moments it has its peaks but yeah if they, if they have other interests outside but i do like how you have them all in somewhat of a sense whether it's their own interest and I, i'm assuming it is but they all play an instrument or all play fiddle like I like to imagine my own mind one day when you're like, 
uh, mom wants a own, <laughs> mom wants a family band, so let's do this. <laughs> and they're like, oh, mom, come on, get another hobby. You fiddle, you fiddle, you you fiddle. And then it's like, well, what are we gonna call ourselves? I already got the name. We're just gonna be the McMaster family. It's like, what about one of us play the spoons? Fiddler and the spoons. <laughs> how how about bare naked babies? Yeah, bare, bare naked babies. Yeah, I feel like you got to be careful with that one. Some people might show up to the show and be like, I, I wasn't expecting to see what we got, but, yeah. and then maybe you get someone from the bare naked ladies to be like, hey, either feature us or we're gonna sue. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but no, that's that's a good point. Uh, the other thing I kind of want to get into, uh, as well is, you know when you have seven kids and again they all play instruments when you're doing uh, I, I can't remember how many years you've been doing this now but the like christmas concert specials but like how much prep work goes into that in all your performances even with the children like do they sometimes get tired and say mom like not tonight and you're like no we that's not an option <laughs> It varies depending on the ages. So when they were younger, um, which some of them are still younger like that, yeah, I didn't want it to be, we might have something that we practiced and worked out and you'd be dying for them to do it, but if they got cold feet or if they just weren't in the mood or something, at a young enough age, you just say, that's fine, because you don't want them to feel like they pushed. have to do this. Yeah. Um, but then, and I would say those are ages like five, four, five, six, even seven is perhaps acceptable too. But at some point when they start to develop their reasoning and you want to develop morals in your kids, um, there have been a couple of times where, you know, they're nine, 10, and they're sometimes not feeling that well. And yeah. as a mother, you know, it's nothing serious or, they're just, for whatever reason, they're just not in the mood or something. And that's when they have a chance to learn about commitments and about, um, you know, if you're going to commit to something, you have to try your best to do it. And I, I always say to them, you know, if you're not feeling well, for example, if you feel a little, little under the weather or whatever, you don't have to do this. You yeah. don't have to do this. Mommy and this is mommy and daddy's show. But don't not do it because you're not in the mood. Yeah. Mommy's been on stage lots of times not feeling well. This is a chance for you to learn that, like, you know, some people, they go to work and they just have to go to work. They have important yeah. jobs. And, you know, and now people, there's people here who, you know, at that, at those ages, they're, they're kind of like, we know that the crowd is expecting a little something from kids. So we might say, you know, people are expecting that you might come out and, it's okay if you don't, but you don't want to disappoint them if you're just thinking you don't, not in the mood. Like yeah. you have, you know. So every single time we have those conversations, and they're they're nothing. There's nothing too much fighting, you know. It's <laughs> very easy, and every time they rise to the occasion, and we make them feel like a million bucks. Yeah, I you feel know? like yeah. I, I feel like with those conversations, it's it's good. But like you know, when there's a lot of like tap dancing involved, just say if there's like you having an argument with your your son and both of you have this thing on stage where both of you have to tap dance at the same time. I almost wonder like, cause sometimes when they're kids, they don't, they're, they're, their mindset is somewhere else, right? So I, I just kind of laugh at it. Like you, when you stamp out of a room and you're mad, you're like, you stamp out of a room and then you leave. I feel like sometimes it's like some people are like, geez, they're, they're really tap dancing really hard up there. It's almost like he's trying to tell, tell his mom something like, I don't like that you put me on stage, blah, blah, blah. And then you're just still like, I did it because I wanted you to succeed. And he just comes back with like, I get it, but still I want to go home. <laughs> so yeah, I know people wonder stuff like that too. Yeah. Of course they do. I would too. I still do. In fact, when I see families doing stuff together, I wonder like how into it are they or how much yeah. they feel like they have to do it or how much is coming from them. You know, no parent generally speaking wants to be someone who forces their kids into things. Um, that being said, I, I treat the music like vegetables, like vegetables are good for you and you do have to learn to eat some. Okay. You yeah. don't have to finish your broccoli, but you have to eat it. You have yeah. to eat a little bit. You have to get used to those flavors. They're good for you, you know? And so 
there's nothing wrong with saying to your, or you don't say to them, I guess, at young ages, but there's nothing wrong as a parent thinking, I know music is good for my child and I know they can keep rhythm and they can keep pitch. So yeah. I'm going to enroll them in our homeschool music program, just like I would in school, if they're in school, you know, and teach them. And it's up to them whether they want to carry the torch, but there's, call it, call it music class, you know, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't have to be anything that's forced, but it's, like teaching them math or making them eat their vegetables, you know they have to learn it. Uh, I know the value in it. I yep. know the value far exceeds anything, any subject I ever learned in school. Like, there is no replacement for what music gives the soul. And it's eternal. And I have proof of that multiple times over my life. And I do want to give that gift to my kids. What they do with it in their older days that's up to them, you know, like everything else in life. I want them to be happy. And so, yeah, some of them may, may really, it may become a part of their, who they are. And some of them, it may be just something they do on the side. Who knows? Now, like, I, I kind of want to get into this as well. Um, just because we're on the topic with kids, uh, you know, it's pandemic. It's, I'm, I'm assuming in Ontario, it's like a lot of homeschooling. We have seven. I know that's like still a, a big number to me, like seven, but like seven kids trying to be homeschooled. Um, or let's, yeah, let's say around seven. I'm sure there's not all of them being homeschooled, but let's say how, like how frustrating, well, I guess not frustrating, but like when you look at that, like, is it overwhelming at times when you hear like, where's my iPad? Like, no, I, can you keep it down? I'm trying to learn over here. Or like you, this room, you, that room, you, and then you're like, as a parent, you still gotta be like, are they are they online? Are they doing something else? Like, so I, how do you, how are you, I guess, adjusting to the online uh, world of the pandemic? It's fine. I I embrace it because we did a lot of online online schooling. Um, I don't homeschool the kids. You know, when we say we homeschool, everybody looks at me and thinks, oh my gosh, she does that too. Well, I used to. Yeah. Um, when they were younger, I used to. Now my older kids are getting into, like, well, the math is just way over my head. And so, yeah, I've learned to seek and find other uh, places to yeah. have, to teach them in our home. So, like, um, they do, um, for example, an old babysitter of mine, um, she has moved to England and she got her degree in history over in at Oxford and she's incredibly um, you know uh, schooled in in history and so she does a history program with my kids through Skype for the last three years and so we're used to that as homeschoolers we're used to having exterior teaching um, and so that that has remained and during COVID it hasn't changed much like you know and the kids believe it or not it, it when you start homeschooling they get used to the way it works and they can really do most of it on their own yeah like they do a lot of it on their own and because they're just used to the books and the way they go and they yeah and they just ask me as they need or they with other courses they have a teacher they can ask and my girls were on a course today um studying the chronicles of narnia series and it's a homeschooling program out, out west it's called wisdom academy so i had claire and julia who are nine or 10 and 11 years old, both on that course today. So that again was through Zoom. And so we're used to that. As far as balancing a household full of seven kids and being sure where they're at and what they're doing, like again, anything in life, you start with one, you start easy and you just, you, you become all of a sudden you become a parent and then you become a homeschooling parent and then you become a fiddler who's also, career and also homeschooling and then you become the parent who's delegating and then you become the the cook and the this and you become all these things slowly and steadily it's building and building and more kids and more kids and before you know it you don't bat an eye you just it's just life it's just your norm yeah it's it's like when i see kind of like the commercials or like advertisements on tv and they show you like more than one kid or like an argument like i, I look at it from there's one i think it's I believe I could be wrong it's like a coffee commercial or whatever she's like dreaming off in her own land while the two boys are in the background fighting and then she comes to the realization like a teddy bear hits her in the head and the two boys start laughing go like sorry mom and I'm like imagining like having seven going around not at all like all different ages but like they're like a moment where you're like I just want some peace and then 
it's just so like it's like hey I, I need help with this like if again if they're all girls or if they're all boys and they're all around the same age it's like you know if they're all just say 13 year old boys playing hockey you know the argument is somewhere along the way of where's my hockey stick where's my hockey gear or girls of like who stole my brush or like you know where's my ballet shoes or where is my hockey stick like you know even if they're involved with sports but all different ages all different arguments can come up and like at any point and then it's like the 15 year old could try could try to i guess get the say the eight-year-old or five-year-old to understand like hey you don't do this and then it's like <laughs> you're just still like ah uh, where do i begin but i i think for the most part judging by your answer it's very cool calm collected um so yeah, I, 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 I um, didn't go too yeah, far there. <laughs> credit for because I was waiting for that time when you mentioned when the younger ones coming in the background. I was expecting like a whole herd of elements to come in and be like, "She's free, <laughs> let's let's go tackle her." <laughs> yeah, it's actually, you know, my husband always says when he was gone, you know, go to school and then come home. If your mother wasn't home, there was that you just knew she wasn't home, and you just things weren't right. There was no balance. Yeah. But he said she could be home and you wouldn't need her or anything. You just, just knowing she was home gives you peace of mind. So I'm up here doing this, this, um, this interview and my kids, they just know I'm home. They know I'm upstairs. I'm either practicing or doing an interview or working on some piece of music or something. And, and as far as them all tackling me, I think that, um, the novelty, I, the, the older ones are just like my 15 year old's not going to do that. And my 13 year old's way too cool to. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're at that but Sadie and Maria, Sadie's six and Maria's two. And they, when I walk in the door, I could be gone for five minutes. And why shouldn't say the door? When I go downstairs out of this room, they're like, hi, mom. And they come over and they hug me and they tackle me. Yeah. And it just, it's so great. Yeah. It's so great. It's, yeah, because I, I feel like as you get older, it's almost like you, I, I laugh at it from the standpoint of everyone goes through it. It's like you get to that certain age gap where it's like, I don't want to be seen with you. I don't want people to know that we're related. And then you get older and you're kind of like, all right, like you, you kind of justify it where it's like, hey, I was trying to be cool. I needed, I needed that like off parent vibe. But as you get older, it's like, I don't care if you see me with my mom in public, whatever. I seen you with your mom. What a big whoopee. Okay. But yeah. I just love the fact of, um, you know, when you bring that up, because I, I can imagine you saying that now when they're older of, you know, if Sadie's run to you and you mentioned to your 15 year old, like you used to do that too. They're like, mom, don't, don't say that. Like, no one wants to hear that. And then like, when they get to like 25 or something, like tell that story again, mom, tell, tell that story about how I used to run, run to you. It's like, no, you were too cool. You were too cool to hear that. Um, but no, I think that's interesting. Uh, I, I, I kind of want to do bring up one point there because when I'm looking at the background now in whole, like to me, has has the boys ever brought up to you? Like, I know we were all fiddlers, but have they ever brought up and said, this would be a great space to make a game center or to watch hockey games? Or have you just basically said, no. <laughs> it's never come up. Really? That's not to, that's not to say it won't, but yeah. no, it's never I, come up. I, I mean, I feel like, we built, I feel like you we built, put down. <laughs> uh, when we built our house 10 years ago, this space the kids used to call it the fly room because it was infested with flies because we never finished it this oh. is the room of the garage we didn't we didn't need this room we didn't know we thought well we'll just we were even going to make it like a fake room you know where you don't actually have real windows and yeah. i remember saying well we better put real windows in you never know maybe over the maybe maybe a mother in, in law or or a parent or something they, they might lose a spouse they might need a room or like i don't know you're trying to think of things so for a good six years, seven years, this was the fly room. It was just collected flies. Kids wouldn't go near it. In fact, if I wanted to scare them, I'd say, if you don't stop that, I'm putting you in the fly room. And now, now, like they, so they, my point is they've been here and are aware of when we converted it. And we spent a long time trying to figure out what kind of flooring to put on because it, it's actually a sprung floor so that they can practice dancing. Oh, in wow. here so they were excited like oh my gosh we have a uh, space to dance and practice and then it was all about music this is music space and now we put studio equipment in here now and now we're recording in here it's become a studio yeah and so no they're they've been excited with every little change and growth that this room has had over the years 
I don't think it's even crossed their mind. Mind you, we have a massive basement, and the kids are playing hockey. The boys are playing hockey down there all the time, smashing the walls. So they know if there's going to be a game, it's going down there. Yeah, the last thing I kind of get, I guess, I want to ask you is, you know, because we kind of touched that at the beginning, but just to kind of wrap it up here, but like when you look back at all the stuff that you've accomplished, like the Order of Nova Scotia, Order of Canada, uh, like what do you expect, I guess, when you're, and I, I it's, it's going to sound bad, but it's like, when, you know, when you're gone or when you're like, and your kids are left, yeah. like, what's, what's the legacy that you want people to remember? Ugh. And it sounds like such a horrible question because it's like, you know, like- Not at all, like, like, not at all. Like, I think you're doing a great go, go, go <laughs> It's a great interview. It's a great question. Um, I think I just wanted them to know I tried in every aspect. I just want them to know I tried. I, I fail lots at things, but I want them to know I never stopped trying. I have a um, chalkboard on my in my kitchen, and I'm always trying to do things to inspire them to be kinder, to love more, to be charitable, to treat each other nicely, to keep the house tidy, to practice, all these things too. So I bought this little chalkboard, and this is just one of the main many things I'm constantly doing. But I I put on it every day. I'll put on it an inspirational quote usually from a saint or something like that, but sometimes I'll even say to the kids, you put your own quote on. And the thing is, it's the person who writes the quote remembers the quote the best. They don't know that. They think, oh, I'm so lucky I get to use the chalk. But they'll remember the quote the best. So um, what did I put on yet? To, uh, actually, yesterday. Sometimes it stays on a couple of, for a couple of days. It was like... Um, it was basically only use... It, others should be treated with kindness and, and and I guess I can't remember the exact words, but the second half of the quote is only use anger if it's an absolute necessity. Only use harsh words if it's an absolute necessity. And so um, so in here the other day, all oh, there was a little kerfuffle. Somebody was was. Uh, one of the older kids was helping one of the younger kids with their math and the younger child got really angry because you know they want to do it their way right yeah. and they kind of this little miniature explosion happens between the personalities and somebody stomped off and so i said uh-huh wait now wait now was that a necessity you just got really angry here like was that a was it necessary like did you ask them once nicely first if they would just, you know, stop or let you do something. No, I didn't. So, so hopefully those little, by living, you know, together and having to live and work out, learning how to work together, hopefully that little quote with that little episode, maybe they'll remember that, okay, only get angry when absolutely necessary. What's necessary, mom? And I said, well, there's a little kid, you know, running down the laneway and the cars are on the on the highway and they keep running down there and you've told them a number of times nicely don't run down the laneway well if they keep doing it you might have them have to give them a good licking like hey you get angry at them you say don't go down there you know and because you're you're, you're saving their life really or you know what's good for them so i said those are necessities so you know anyway we'll see if it works so hopefully when i'm gone they'll remember all some of those quotes and Mommy tried to That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Natalie McMaster for coming on to the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob Sang. Thank you for listening, and good night.